Who are you? Hello, I'm Crispin Hellion Glover, uh, and I'm uh, presenting my, my films, uh, What Is It and Everything is Fine. Uh, I'm continuing to tour with them, and people can find out where I'll be with what film on crispinglover.com. And you have no real timeline for this, do you, Crispin Hellion Glover? Like, you just hit the road, you do it. You're doing it the old-fashioned way. Yes, this is vaudeville. It, 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 it's, uh, uh, I, do, I perform a live show before uh, the film, which consists of eight different books. Uh, here's some of the, the books. Uh, one of them is Rat Catching, uh, which is a study in the art of rat catching, plus something extra. As you can see, it's a heavily illustrated book. And when I first started publishing these in 1989, uh, people said to me, oh, you have to have a, uh, you have to have a, a, a book reading. But I, I, here's another book, um, Oakmott, but I, I couldn't have a book reading uh, because if I, if I did just read the books, the illustrations serve as a part of uh, the story and it would just, it, it would be, it would be confusing. Uh, so I always knew I had to have a visual component. So I have eight different books in what I call Crispin Hellion Glover's big slideshow. And uh, it's up on the screen, full-size movie screen. And then I have a dramatic narration that lasts an hour that I prefer form before uh, I show the film. Then I show the film either What Is It, which is 72 minutes long, or the sequel, It Is Fine, Everything Is Fine, which is 74 minutes long. And then after that, I have a question and answer period, which lasts between 45 minutes an hour. And then after that, I have a, a book signing, which goes on until everybody that wants to have books signed or what have you uh, has that. So it's, it's, it's a long evening, but I, it, it's worth it. It, it, it. Because the films... Theoretically, I, I, there were people, there were small uh, companies that were interested in distributing for me, but I have far more wherewithal to go around and, and little by little do these kind of interviews, which are helpful. You know, something like this, I assume, probably will be posted on the Internet and people see it. And if, if you can post the link to crispinglover.com, that's very helpful because that lets people know when I'm going to be where with, with what film, especially if they sign up, it can email them. And because I'm going to be doing this for many years, this is not a traditional way of, of releasing a movie where it all comes out at once and then it's over and then goes out on DVD. I'll be, I'll be touring around with these films for a long time to come. And you have been touring for quite a long time. Like here you are in Vancouver in 2008, but you first came here in 1995 and you started touring well before that. Well, well that was, the, it's true. Uh, I started performing the slideshow in 1993, uh, but I I never really advertised the slideshow so much. I would just I would go and do it. I I at a, a short time period in the mid late 90s, I was showing a rough cut of what is it. Then I I stopped and I didn't perform the slideshow for a number of years, and now I I exclusively do it when I'm touring with with the two films. So so I started touring with what is it in 2005. This is uh, 2008. So it's been three years that I've been touring with What Is It, and uh, then I'll, uh, I started touring with Everything Is Fine in 2007. But I, I'm, I've been touring less with, two th with uh, Everything Is Fine because I'm still going to the cities that I've not gone to, like Vancouver. I had not shown until this, just this time here at the Pacific Cinematheque, uh, I had not sh shown What Is It here at all. Uh, Crispin, he back. Crispin Hellion Glover, your books though, I mean, you didn't write all of the books, some of them are adapted, aren't you? What can you say about the books? Because they're very interesting, the books. What can you tell the people about the books? I love the way you've kind of adapted them. Well, well, it's, it's, yeah, that's not quite accurate. Here, here's a good example. Concrete Inspection is, uh, adaption isn't quite the right word. You can see there's a preface here where it says careful, inspections, uh, careful inspections a vital factor in enduring. And then it skips down. There's a lot of blank space. And it says competent inspection alone is the purpose of this volume. There's spaces in between, you see. So it's, it's almost a, a reversal of reversed writing. I, I suppose you can say that's an adaptation. But traditionally, when you hear an adaptation, you think the intent of what was originally presented is being uh, re uh, not, not even reworked. Well, adapted. <laughs> Rat catch. This, this this is not doing that. Rat catching, though, specifically uses images from no. the. No, no, no. The all uh, the the original binding of rat catching had zero images in it. All That's what I guess I was curious. What's the history of the original rat catching? 
Uh, it's a book uh, I know that was published in England. I think I have the original publishing date here, uh, 1896. So it's over a hundred years o- old. Uh, I don't know because when I when I I found the binding on Hollywood Boulevard in like 1983, and I. I'd never read the original book. There, th- that book has more of the text uh, that was from the original binding than a lot of my books do. Some of the books are just completely original. Uh, my, my my writing with no other with no other text in it. Rat Catching uses some, but even then, it, it's it's quite differentiated. Like here's a page that that's the um, f- sheer amount of text that was originally two pages like this and then it's completely gone so there are portions that are there and then there are portions that are are reworked and rewritten different words are put into it so it's it's quite it's quite altered yeah <laughs> crispin hellion glover in is this he was saying again in is this in is this i was gonna say in the movie is this i'm confused no, i was gonna say in your movie is this <laughs> what is it? What is it? <laughs> In the movie, what is it? There is some great screaming. <laughs> yes. Could you demonstrate that scream? There's an amazing well, scream. I, 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 there is an amazing scream, and that scream is performed by Feruza Balk. And, uh, a Canadian. That's right. In fact, she, she, she lived uh, in Vancouver specifically for quite a long time. Uh, but uh, I, I knew Feruza before uh, bef- before I started shooting. What is it? And uh, I needed somebody to to do a particular voice for one of the snails, and I asked her if she would do it, and she said she would. I, I, she was uh, shooting the craft at the time, but she came over to my my house where we recorded it, and uh, initially I wanted I wanted her to do more of a a hiss or a, a, a kind of a, a different kind of sound she suggested that uh, it be a scream and I said okay that sounds good and then she did these we didn't do many takes just a couple of takes and she did these great uh, screams and then uh, that was still when it was a short film and then I expanded it into a, a feature and I ended up using a lot a lot of the uh, the screaming and and even some of the off-camera uh, vocality that was done and she does dialogue as well well in the film but uh, it's in the film a lot and it, it it's used to a good effect she did a great job so you're showing the film you're doing your slideshow but afterwards you also do a giant question and answer period that's right and that that part is I I'm told a by a lot of people a lot of people consider that the most important part and I as I'm touring around with it I can see that it, it really is uh, and that's and that's part of the this vaudeville element that I think you know vaudeville was the most it, it was at the entertainment industry in the 1800s and the first part of the uh, uh, the twentieth century, and then it's really uh, died away by the end of the twentieth century. But there is a value to it. This this live interactive element uh, that people people get a lot from it, and this uh, having the questions answer the question and answer sessions, particularly with what is it, are just. Uh, it's it's very important for that film because the f- the the film is a you know the title is a question and then uh, the the images and the topics and the juxtapositions of these the juxtaposition of these taboo elements causes genuine questions from people and to not let the people uh, uh, voice their questions or have the opportunity to that would I think leave with a cer- certain amount of frustration which you can you can argue well it's okay for to be for people to be frustrated but I really do find that people get a, a lot from it and I uh, uh, it's valuable. What do you think about the questions, Crispin, Hellion Glover? Because years ago, you're on the David Letterman show. show, and I'm pretty sure that people probably ask about you being on the David Letterman show. Show, yes. <laughs> what do you feel about being on the David Letterman show? Your response to oh, that oh, is, oh, oh, oh. 
Was that me on the David Letterman show? Well, what what my 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 response generally has been for the the this the the appearance that's so very well known is that I I don't confirm or deny whether that was uh, me on the show or or uh, whether that was me on the show. You want people to do their own research and determine for themselves. Like look at this face right there. <laughs> that's right. Look at the Crispin and Hellion Glover face. Right. Then go to YouTube and check out the David Letterman clip. They can do that. And yeah. See if it's the same person. But but there's You know how many people have done that Crispin Hellion Glover? Like over a million. 1,135,000 people have done that. That's great. That is pretty interactive for question and answer period, isn't it? <laughs> it's a good thing, I must say. Now even now whether that was me or not, like I say, I won't confirm or deny, but but the the idea that that people are wondering if that's me and then uh, or wondering what happened on that particular show and then doing uh, further research and going to crispinglover.com and finding out about about these shows that I perform is a very a very good thing and and it 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 goes to show that when there is question about something when there is not necessarily an answer because no matter how you look at that show it is not exactly a hundred percent certain what, what it is that's happened there and uh, and I and and that's something I'm very interested I, I in I like when people are able to question things and think about things and I think that's important and people can come to the big slide show and talk to you and they can also give you gifts and also present you with interesting stuff can't they Crispin Hill and cover in Toronto is it true that you bought a painting of your nose from a fan <laughs> as a matter of fact that is true and uh, <laughs> I, I I you know I, I very rarely uh, buy modern paintings and um, I even more rarely, I don't like having images of myself up or around uh, in general. But this particular painting that she she did was really it really was very good. It was just it was just of my nose, and she did a very good job. And uh, she came to I, I had I, it was in Toronto, and I. Uh, but uh, I think it was two years previous to the the show where she actually presented it to me to purchase. She there, she had a show that had a lot of paintings, not of just of my nose, but there were a lot of different paintings, and some of the paintings were of me. And I I had said to her I particularly like the one the the, the one of, that was just of the nose. And so when she, these couple of years later she came came to the show and said that she'd. Uh, save this painting for me because I had said I was interested in it and uh, I, I she wanted to know if I wanted to buy it and I I, I said well I've got to contemplate it I don't generally buy or or I mo modern uh, paintings in general and uh, especially things of myself but uh, I did think about it and I thought well it's a good painting and I should s support this and then I, and I liked it so uh, I you have a painting of your nose I do indeed you bought a painting of your nose and you're encouraging people to bring their artwork to the I shows know. and then you will buy their artwork I'm definitely not not encouraging that in fact uh, I f you know I fly uh, to in and out of these uh, uh, cities and of course now with uh, weight restrictions I, I and I, I often am traveling with the film and 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 things for the show so I I don't want to have a lot of stuff to carry with me so I'm, I'm not encouraging people to bring things for me to buy to the show it's interesting you say you're carrying the film there's only one copy of the film isn't there you're like Stanley Kubrick you're keeping it close to you yeah I uh, I'm very careful about the film for a lot of different reasons one is one is piracy uh, uh, and the way that I'm recouping, and I'm specific to say the word recouping as a, opposed to profiting, because uh, the the films for me they were relatively inexpensive for what a 35 millimeter film uh, costs. Uh, what does it cost me? Somewhere between between 150 and 200 thousand dollars to make, which for a 35 millimeter film is not not that much, but for me it's a lot of money and I do need to recoup that but the way that I'm going to recoup that is by by touring with the the slideshow and and selling the books I generally do a um, 
a 50-50 split on the box office uh, with what the, the venue normally charges for their box office. Uh, and then for what I charge over for performing the slideshow and for my books, I keep, I keep that, that money. So that's really where the, the, the money, the, the uh, recoupment of, the, of my investment will, will come from. Uh, I'm, I haven't yet recouped on e either of the films. I'm getting closer on what is it, but even then, when, when I say recoup, it's not on the box office. It's not, it's not actually on the film itself. It's on me performing the shows and selling the books, but that's okay. It's the film is enabling me uh, to, to do it that way, and, and that's fine. I just want to be able to recoup so I can continue to do uh, other, uh, make, make more of my own films, and really the, the thing that enables me to continue doing that is by acting in other people's movies, so that's still a very important part of uh, what I do. Crispin, Helly, and Glover, what can you tell me about this gentleman right here from this band SWAT? Adam Parfree. Well, uh, Adam's in, everything is fine. Well, this isn't him. That's not Adam, though. That's one of his... Uh, He's in this band, though. Yes, I think this is a band that he... He does the lyrics for Adam Parfrey from the movie What Is It? Well, he's he's in What Is It? He plays a very important character in it, and uh, I've known Adam since the late '80s, and uh, uh, he uh, he's a friend of mine, and uh, he had a, a good influence on on What Is It as well. He's a very interesting character, like the name Adam Parfrey. People may not know it right off the bat, right. but he is the gentleman behind Feral House Publishing. He's basically responsible for some of the research of death metal because he put out the book Lords of Chaos. I, I, so when you're going on tour showing your films and stuff, you're helping spread the word of death metal, Chris Benelli and Glover. Well, well, it may be so. I mean, I, I, uh, uh, I'm more familiar. I know, I know about that book, uh, but I know more. Uh, uh, Apocalypse Culture uh, is uh, another one of his books, and uh, Apocalypse Culture 2, I have an article in which has uh, something about subtext in, in what is it. And he's, he's published a lot of different, uh, uh, a lot of different uh, kind of uh, material in, in, in Feral House, and it's very uh, interesting and intelligent material, and I, I recommend people to, to look at it. I had sex with E.T. <laughs> well, did you like it? I had sex with E.T. <laughs> well, did was it good? What am I alluding to? Entertainment tonight? <laughs> I don't know. No, you have a connection. I had sex with E.T. Crispin Helly and Glover. Uh, Steven Spielberg? No, <laughs> the producer. The producer of your CD was. Uh, who produced your CD? Uh, uh, well, it was produced by Barnes and Barnes. Barnes and Barnes, whose first EP was called. Oh, is that I had sex with ET? I didn't even. Yes. Know that. Oh, I, I was totally lost. That's so great to hear you say that I had sex with ET. <laughs> How long have you known Drew Barrymore? Uh, well, I I actually met. It, it was interesting. I was sitting in a restaurant uh, when I God, it was a long time ago, and I had just published Rat Catching, so it was 1988. And she was in a rest in, in the restaurant with her mother. She was only like thirteen or fourteen. She had just published a book. I think it's called Little Girl Lost. Exactly. Yes. Right? Her and, and her mom Jade. Right. 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 And they were in this restaurant together. And I, uh, I had never met them before, but they walked by and uh, we said hello. And uh, uh, then years later, she ended up being the producer of uh, of uh, the the Charlie's Angels films that I I was in. So, but I, I, I like her a lot. She's a very nice person. But speaking of having sex with E.T., Barnes & Barnes, who helped you, who helped produce your CD right here, right, they're amazing. They're the guys behind Fish Heads, the video Fish Heads. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And they, they approached me uh, to... Perform a, to perform a song. I didn't really know what they wanted altogether. Uh, I had known some of their, their work and I, I liked it and I thought, oh, well, this would be enjoyable. And then uh, we recorded, I think first we recorded some of my book readings actually, which there are book readings on this as well as, as original songs. Uh, it's called The Big Problems, It's Not Equal to Solution, The Solution Equals Let It Be. And there's a, a concept that there are there are all of the entities in it have something in common and people can figure out what the big problem is. 
Uh, it was before the internet was around, and so there was a telephone number which now has, well, it's still on there, although I should have them take it off because the telephone no, number is no longer uh, working, but now there is uh, my, my website, crispinglover.com. Uh, but because it was before website, it was a way to get people to know about the, the books. But I, but I said they can call and leave uh, what the, uh, the uh, solution is to the big problem. And, and people did, and they, 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 they figured out what, what it was. It isn't terribly complicated. And, uh, uh, but it was, uh, I, I, I didn't start out to, to knowing that it would be a record. I, I recorded uh, some book readings. I recorded uh, some original songs. And then they said to me that they wanted to make it into a record. And then I started realizing I should really have a concept behind it. And then I wanted to get rid of some of the things that we'd recorded so it could fit into this certain kind of concept. And one of the producers kind of didn't like that. <laughs> they, they wanted to use everything. But I, I still think it was good that we got rid of some of it. Well, it's amazing to get Barnes and Barnes. I mean, the fish heads, guys. Like, I think you were so lucky, Chris, but you got the fish head. Like, the, what can you say about the video fish heads? I like it. I think it's a very good video. And I, uh, and I, and I like those guys. They were, they were really uh, good, good people to work with. And I... Uh, I look back on it fondly. What music are you into now, Crispin, Haley, and Glover? Like, there hasn't been a CD from you in how many years? 1988, and that's 20 years. So, yeah, get to it. What's going on? I actually did, uh, with one of the two uh, Barneses, there's Art and Artie Barnes, and uh, I think it's Artie Barnes is the is the name of the, the fellow that I, I did uh, uh, produce we're very we we some of we we you did something for Willard, right? Well, we did that as well, but even before that, we have basically have a whole album's worth of of stuff. I need to maybe record one more thing and I need to fix some of the tracks. And I've been so busy with the films and and he has a family and we just haven't gotten around to uh, uh completing it and we we should. I Any cover songs? Can you give us any hints what might be on it? Um there are some cover songs on it, but some of them uh, some of them are, it, it would be called the, the B Big Love Recordings, and uh, I, I, it's, the same, it's a similar situation where there might be some songs, I don't know which ones I'm going to keep on or, or leave off, I've got to get back into that project at that point, but... Uh, I, I, I can't sing one for us right now. I'm not. I'm not a good uh, a cappella uh, 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 singer. I, 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 I. It's something you know. People have said I should do songs on the uh, on the show, and I've I've contemplated it because there is something about when when people hear that it's music, it has this other kind of marketability or something. But I really don't consider myself a, a, a singer. Uh, although my very first uh, professional job when I was 14 years old, uh, I was in The Sound of Music and I, uh, at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion and Florence Henderson played Maria and she still looked like Carol Brady from the, the Brady Bunch at the time. It was 1978 uh, when I did that. So uh, I, I sang all those songs, but I, I, I don't consider myself a, a singer and it's something that especially live would make me nervous. I'm not nervous when I go and I perform my, my show because uh, as a performer, that's something I'm, I'm quite... Uh, ready and prepared for but singing I know I could go off key and and it's in a recording studio you know you can there are ways to fix that well, and and I mean like this this record was made before you uh, you know there's these modern things where they can even put you in tune all of the the this was recorded uh, so that uh, I am singing it in tune but I would go in and punch in you know you go into a certain part part if I went off and I'd, I'd fix it whereas live I would feel uncomfortable uh, possibly doing that I know if I really rehearsed it I could so but it would just it would it would the the show really works quite well as the as the as the big slideshow uh and Is I've been doing it for so long and I, actually there's a second slideshow that I'm going to start performing before the everything is fine when I start uh, showing both of the films uh, at the same time. Crispin, Helen Glover, winding up here, is there any music you think that might fit in with the slideshow? What music are you digging right now? Well, I, uh, for, for the most part, I, I listen to uh, Beethoven, post-Beethoven romantic era uh, music. I, 
I, Beethoven's generally my favorite, and I, I listen to a lot of it. But I, I listen to a, a lot of different things. Uh, but that's that really is is my favorite. And uh, uh, there certainly is music in both. What is it? And everything is fine. Um, uh, and any it, popular artists? You know, pop rock. Any punk rock artists? Or people that come to the gigs and check you out? Um, not not throw their CDs like Crispin. You mean that come to my show? Yeah. Um, I have had some people come to the show that were in, in well-known uh, bands, but but I I haven't had anybody throwing throwing the CDs. But but uh, uh, what I I I tend toward listening to a much much older music. I mean, I'm aware of uh, a popular um, uh, music and, and modern uh, contemporary music, and sometimes I'll, I'll listen to that. But for the most part, I really do listen to a lot uh, of much older music. However, Crispin, Helly, and Glover, you do love cars, don't you? <laughs> well, I, I have a mixed feeling about cars. In certain ways, I, I really hate cars, and I don't like driving. I live in Los Angeles, where well, and I also own property in the Czech Republic, uh, which I... I, I, my property is not too far outside of Prague, and I actually prefer taking public transportation. I, I don't like driving that much. But in Los Angeles, I do, and, I, and when I'm in Prague, I, I take public transportation. Where I'm, when I'm almost anywhere else, unless somebody's driving me, I take uh, public transportation. But much, much like... I do, I do have a lot of cars. In yeah, like much like rat catching, you're helping preserve a generation, aren't you, with your car collection? Oh. What are some of the cool cars going, like the Jaguar? <laughs> I do have a 19... Uh, 53 XK120 Jaguar, which is really a beautiful car. I think it's the most beautiful uh, pr production uh, uh, sports car, I, 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 and, and it's quite quite pretty. And so is I also have a very pretty uh, 1954 uh, Bentley uh, R-type uh, Park Ward. Uh, uh, drop head coupe so it's uh, it's a rare car and also has quite quite beautiful lines and there's other ones I have too many cars I I I didn't. I don't mean to have a, a collection. I don't think of myself as a car collector. I kind of don't like the idea of it, but I, I do have these these cars, and 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 they're pretty. <laughs> well, so it may come in handy, Crispin, Helen, Glover. For instance, you're not too comfortable with the talk show format. You know, going way back to Letterman, are you? You don't really like the talk show format. I don't mind. I, I actually, in certain ways, I prefer the talk show uh, format to print because. Well, you know, a, a creative editor can take something and, and, and make it out of context, uh, but it's more difficult in a way to take things out of context. If I can, if I write things, I, I can quite clearly put stuff together and I, I may, you know, do something that's more put together in terms of publishing that's specifically writing something out as opposed to these books are more created uh, 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 books that are art pieces. Uh, but uh, in certain ways, you, you're almost less um, misrepresented, unless you're purposefully misrepresenting yourself, or you can, you can say things that are, are wrong. But in certain ways, you're, you're more clearly represented by these, these, these talks, talk kind of shows. Like it, for what is it? How many talk shows would have you on for that? Like, I read something where not all the talk shows would have you on, like Conan had you on, but could you explore traditional media for movies like that? Well, uh... Probably not. You know, the, those those kind of late night uh, big big uh, audience talk shows are relying uh, as well on the corporately funded and distributed films because that helps bring viewership into their their shows. So if something that's really not of that kind of uh, hugely distributed all at the same uh, time corporate funding corporate I'm putting this wrong, but films that are not corporately funded and distributed in in that traditional sense uh, are less likely to be represented on, on those shows, especially at this point in time. Because I was thinking you have an in. Jay Leno has an incredible car collection. You have cars. <laughs> I suppose it's something. I was on uh, the, the, the Jay Leno show, uh, The Tonight Show, with Jay Leno. I was also on it with Johnny Carson. In fact, I, I think I just published this book, Oak Mott, and... Uh, he, I remember he picked up the book, he, he kind of went through it like this, and he said, ladies and gentlemen, this looks, what did he say? He said, ladies and gentlemen, this looks like the inside of Charles Manson's notebook, 
or diary or something. Baboom. <laughs> <It was just> like, <laughs> but you've covered a Charles Manson song, haven't you? Yeah, that's right. It's on this, and I actually used the same song in uh, in uh, uh, everything is I mean, in 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 what is it? Um, is is that Jay Leno that said that. Jay Leno said, that he, ladies, something to the effect of, ladies and gentlemen, this looks like the inside of Charles Manson's uh, workbook. Now, I, 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 I beg to differ. I don't think that does look like the inside. I, and, I, you know, I, he didn't make books like that. <laughs> How about Johnny Carson, though? That's incredible to be on Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was on that. Uh, I was on it with, twice with him, and it was a very interesting experience. I... Uh, uh, so he had you back. He had you back. Yeah, yeah. I, I went on tw right, right in a row, and f uh, twice in a row. Uh, uh, it was for River's Edge, and uh, it was in the same year. In fact, that the the, the show, or in, within a month, within weeks, in fact, of the uh, show that I don't confirm or deny whether I was on David Letterman show. So uh, yeah, I was on it uh, uh, a couple of times. He he was, you know, it was a very different kind of interviewing style that Johnny Carson had. Uh, than a lot of uh, uh, modern interviewers, which I, I really quite liked. I mean, he he enjoyed eccentricity and uh, and would make that look good, which is not is not always a, a current trend in in uh, in interviewing styles. Uh, but I, 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 yeah, I've been on with the, most of the the, the big uh, uh, interviewing uh, elements, and uh, some of them are better interviewers uh, than others. But I, like, I actually think um, Howard Stern is a very good interviewer because what he tends toward doing is he he likes to pull the um, he likes to get get away from the persona. Most people have a, a persona that is a, you know, uh, they, they may... On-off switch. Well, it may or may not. You know, it's like there are people that, that I don't think differentiate between what their persona is and what they, uh, what they are as a person, which I don't think is terribly healthy. I think it's healthier to understand there's a differentiation between what one is in the media and what is what one is in their own personal life i'm i'm quite clear on it uh but but uh for me that's why being interviewed with Howard Stern is good because he likes to 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 get rid of that uh, persona in a way or get underneath it because there's usually some kind of falsity for me i don't mind because i feel like there are a lot of misconceptions and so if somebody's kind of trying to dig into the truth of something i actually i actually pr prefer that but I mean, I, I, I don't mind when, when it goes the other way as well. I mean, it, it, that's why I, I, I think it's good to look at it separately because from your own self because uh, it is a business element. You know, the, the, there, there's, when, when you're in, a, in the entertainment industry, you know, I'm, I'm born with the, my name given to me at birth was Crispin Hellion Glover. I used uh, Crispin Glover as my my acting name when I got an agent when I was 13 or when I I had to join SAG when I was 13 and I thought Crispin Hellion Glover was too too long I'd always use my whole name for writing and for uh, for drawing that's why it made sense to continue on uh, with with my books I I had made the books not to to publish these were just things I made on on my own so it was it was how I'd used my my I had always signed my my uh, my artwork or writing was my whole name. Uh, that's why I use it for. It's a continuation of what I've always done when I write the the movies or directing. It seems to make sense to to use that. What about your name being used, Crispin Hellion Glover? Like for instance, I heard there's a religion now on the internet called Gloverism. Well, well, those things of course are are fine. And if people put my name on a band or something or in a song or something like that, it's it's good. It's good advertising. Uh, but but I, I think as I was starting to say, I feel it's good to separate that. Where it's like, yes, I w was born or and then given that name, and you kind of identify yourself with with your name. But ultimately, it's a separation from what what you are in your day to day life, as opposed to you may have influence on what this this persona is, and you can 
kind of uh, suggest things for people to say or you, you, you talk to a reporter and you say things but of course it's going to be their interpretation of, of what you say uh, or even if how something's edited uh, this could be edited in such a way that it would just be like a few sentences here and there and likely it is we've been talking for a long time and obviously they can't use all of this on a, on a show but uh, you can have influence on these things, but you can't control it, really. Well, thank you so much for your time, Crispin, Haley, and Glover. I really appreciate it. There is one last thing I want to ask you, though. Is it true you sleep in a coffin filled with tar? No, <laughs> that's absolutely not true. I haven't even heard that one before. A coffin filled with tar. Yes. I would die. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you would die if you slept in a coffin filled with tar, because you, your, your skin would, you would, uh, your, <laughs> you breathe through your skin. You would, you. You're the toxins would kill you. <laughs> I don't. I don't own a coffin either. So, but a coffin, even with tar, that's even more. Did you really read that somewhere? Apparently, I asked you that. You asked me that. Apparently, I asked you that in 1995. Oh, really? And what did I react? How did I react then? I have no idea because I don't think I actually did ask that. So the question was invented, and the answer was invented. <laughs> For, so I was part of the Crispin Helly and Glover mystique. You go to Wikipedia, and me and you are there. Really? Yes. Oh. About how I asked you if you slept in a coffin filled with tar. What does it say on Wikipedia that I answered? You don't know. There's no conclusion for it. Just like everything else. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that and that's. Thank you for answering it. Finally, you've set the record straight. Thank you for asking it, so the record could be set straight. Well, Crispin and Helen Glover, why should people care about the big slideshow? Why should people care about what is it? Well, uh, uh, I mean. I don't know. Well, I, I can a answer it in a lot of different ways, but but I care care about it because I I do think that the particularly with what is it, I do think that uh, there are not questions being asked in a lot of corporately funded and distributed media at this point in time, and it's important to get into some genuine questions and into territory in general, not just with what is it. Everything is fine goes into territory that is not normally dealt with or isn't dealt with in corporately funded and distributed film and uh, and and territory where people can really think and really ask questions is an important thing to have happen and that's that's what I'm uh, aspiring to do well thanks so much for your time Crispin Helly and Glover keep on rocking in the free world and do 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 I hope I got that right yeah perfect thank Good. you thank you <laughs>